there's a dry part to this, sort of a serious point-by-point -point critique of basically a series of myths um, that neoliberal economics has managed to perpetrate and sell with tremendous success can be sort of a, it's an important task, um, but it can be dry. And before doing that, um, I want to go ahead and describe for you, here in Europe, you know the bottom line. You know the storyline of what happened with the financial crisis. You know there was a housing bubble in the United States. You know that the financial industry was deregulated in the United States, that the housing bubble burst, and we had the worst financial crisis since the crash of 1929, almost 80 years ago. Um, and that this financial crisis quickly made its way across the Atlantic Ocean. And that's accurate enough as basically a summary of, of what occurred. Um, but it's important, I believe, to truly understand how little legitimacy the people who are still running the global economy deserve to have. Um, part of our problem is still that too many people stand in awe of the wizards of Wall Street who must be incredibly brilliant. Otherwise, how could they make all that money for themselves? Um, and too many politicians basically have bought into sort of the neoliberal storyline about what it is that works and what doesn't work. And I think part of deprogramming ourselves is understanding just what colossal mistakes they made. So I'm going to tell you the details of exactly how this financial crisis broke in the United States. Um, mostly so that you will Never, once you know the details, you will never hold these people in awe again. And that's my real purpose. Um, and I can tell you that it's, I don't consider myself to be um, naive when it comes to the financial industry. When I finally found out exactly what they had done and how it had happened, my jaw literally dropped open. It is a truly amazing story. So I thought I would take us through this story um, of exactly how it is that this financial crisis came into being before then going on to a sort of a systematic critique or what are the major myths. There's essentially six major myths that they have created about free enterprise and markets. And there's three major myths they've created about government. Um, obviously, the six major myths about free enterprise and markets is how wonderful they are, what wonderful things they always do. And the three myths about government is how unnecessary or incompetent government will inevitably be. And then, of course, there are two major myths about globalization. So we'll get to those, but let's treat ourselves to what is an, astoundingly, an astounding story that also has some entertainment value. So I'm going to take us through that first. Yeah, let's see if I can do it this way. There are basically seven steps. And <clears throat> before, for a period of about 40 or 50 years in the United States, the mortgage industry was a very humdum, humdrum industry that basically plodded along with very little excitement where local banks would review applications from people asking for mortgages. They would check their credit worthiness, and then they would go ahead and decide whether to give them a 30-year loan. Um, and they would insist on a certain amount of collateral. And the banks that reviewed these mortgage applications took the review rather seriously because they were going to hold this mortgage as an asset on their books for roughly 30 years. Well, the first step was to change all that. Um, and that was, we now are going to have the mortgage banks that are reviewing the applications 
selling those mortgages off to somebody else within a few days of having them signed. And then frequently they would be resold. Um, I remember the last house I bought in the United States. Um, I had three different mortgage holders within 45 days. Um, so <clears throat> that was the first step. And you can see that that already created That created what I would call the first perverse incentive. There was no longer any incentive for the people reviewing the applications to really care whether these were creditworthy customers, yes or no. That was the perverse incentive. So what's the second step? Well, the second step was Wall Street banks bought up huge numbers. Oh, notice that in the original way the mortgage industry worked in the United States, it worked out pretty well for homeowners. It worked out pretty well for the financial industry. We didn't have any crises. But who isn't involved and who isn't making any money? The big Wall Street banks. And this is a huge market. And of course, they're always looking for a way into a huge market. So they bought up huge numbers of mortgage loans from every region of the country. And they did something really, really creative. They chopped them up into literally thousands of little tiny pieces and then package them into these things called <coughs> securitized debt instruments, which they would sell off to institutional investors and also keep on their own books. So that was the second step. Now we have securitized mortgage debt instruments that are financial assets being held by all sorts of actors, um, not only in the United States, they sold these to the European banks. They sold these to institutional investors in Europe and everywhere in the world. What was the third step? Well, there are rating agencies that have to rate how risky these securitized debt instruments are. But they don't do it for free. And they're not paid by the people who are buying the securities. Who pays the rating agency? Well, it turns out that they're paid by the Wall Street banks that want their securities rated. It should be easy to see why they were able to get AAA ratings for all of these, for all of these assets. If they didn't get a AAA rating from this agency, they'd fire them and get one who would. So there is a second incredibly perverse incentive. We have no incentive for the people who are looking to see whether the loans are actually decent loans to make sure that the people are creditworthy who are getting the mortgages. And we now have, we now have credit agencies that are just handing out, they're stamping AAA on absolutely anything that they're handed by the Wall Street banks. Whoops, went the wrong way. Now, at some point, I mean, investors aren't totally clueless. They can see a housing bubble. They can say to themselves, this housing bubble can't continue to just go on forever. So they get nervous, and they start to get cold feet. And here is where I almost have to marvel of what I would call this is good old Yankee ingenuity. So the Wall Street banks were discovering that particularly the European banks and European investors were starting to get cold feet about buying more and more of these things. So they came up with an idea, said, wait a minute, you're worried that you're buying something that's no good? Take out an insurance policy. And that's where the American International Group, AIG, came in. There was this little tiny insurance company nobody had ever heard of, who within 24 months had become the largest insurance company in the entire world. And they did this by selling insurance policies in case this securitized debt instrument that you have purchased, oh, what happens if a whole bunch of those mortgages and that thing that's packaged in there, what if, they, what, what if the housing bubble bursts, people stop paying on their mortgages, and your asset's no good? We take out an insurance policy, and the name for those things happened to be called credit default swaps. 
AIG sold the insurance, took the premiums, handed it out to their stockholders as, as dividend checks, and basically put very, very little of it aside in case they actually had to pay off. How were they able to get away with this? Well, it just turned out that they were technically not classified as, a, as an insurance company. These actually were insurance policies, but in, under US law, they were not classified as an insurance company selling insurance policies, and therefore they were not subject to any of the regulation that, secure, that insurance companies have to go through to make sure, look, when you're collecting premiums, eventually you have to pay off sometimes, and we've got to be sure that you've got enough set aside. So they set practically nothing aside. So the housing bubble burst, as every bubble inevitably must. Now here's the interesting thing. When the housing bubble burst, what percentage of mortgages, home mortgages in the United States, all of a sudden went into default? Less than 20%. So you basically had 20% of the mortgages are now, are now problematic, but 80% of them are perfectly good. And this is when Wall Street discovered that something they had done without realizing it now put them in a very, very difficult position. The problem is that the securitized debt instruments that they had created, they had whole departments that were packaging these things up. On average, 20% were bad and 80% were good in all of those packages. But there were some that were 95% good and 5% bad. And there were some that were 5% good and 95% bad. And here was the dilemma. How is anybody going to know which is which? And the answer is only the people who put the packages <coughs> together. So what should have been, what should have been sort of, <coughs> let's call it a tidal wave that would have created sort of banged the shores of the, America, of, of the United States only, all of a sudden turns into a tsunami that sweeps all the way around the world. Because here we have all these securitized debt instruments sitting on the books of banks and financial institutions in Europe and the United States. And they should be worth 80% of what they once were. But who would buy any now? Nobody is going to buy them because now <coughs> what the Wizards of Wall Street told us they were doing was being smarter about risk and spreading risk, which is why they didn't need to be regulated. What they were actually doing was hiding the risk. And they did such a good job of hiding it that all of a sudden, nobody was willing to buy these things because nobody knew which were the 95% good ones and which were the 95% bad ones, except the people who put the packages together and who were trying to sell it to you. Now, in particular, in particular, the way that the financial industry now works is, at the very top of the sort of pyramid, you have the large banks and they borrow and lend to one another on a daily basis large amounts of money for short term. And all of a sudden, once Lehman Brothers went under, none of the big banks were willing to lend to any of the other big banks. And the way it worked is the CEO of a big bank would get a call from some other CEO saying, I want to borrow sort of a big amount over a short period of time. And the usual answer is, yes, of course. Here's how much we're going to charge you. It's a done deal. Let's go to the golf course. Now when that call comes in, the CEO says, wow, I don't want to be the fool that just lent a ton of money short term to the bank that actually has a whole bunch of those 95% bad ones, the way Lehman did. So none of the big banks were willing to lend to each other. Because the CEO of every bank would, wanted to know, wait, is it safe for me to make this loan to this other Wall Street bank? And the truth of the matter is, it was a real generational issue. This, this whole securitization thing 
got dreamed up as sort of a new financial instrument after most of the CEOs had already gone through sort of the, the line of ascent in their institution. So they didn't really know what was going on. So they had to call in sort of somebody 20 years younger than them who was head of their own securitization department and said, how can I be sure that this bank's assets are actually sound, not sound? And of course, what the head of his own securitization department told him is, there's no way you can be sure they're good or not. And he would say, why not? And say, because there's no way they can tell if ours is good or not. We know if ours is good or not. They can't tell. And you can't tell if theirs is good or not. And that's what froze the credit system. And that's what basically triggered the financial crisis. You've got a crisis when at the top of your financial pyramid, none of the big players are willing to lend to any of the other big players. And we all live in an economy where all of us are using a credit card and are buying on credit. And all of a sudden, credit dries up for absolutely everybody farther down the chain. <sighs> Now, the bailout, in some sense, suffered the same sort of nasty surprise. Just as the Wall Street banks discovered that by burying, by, by hiding the risk, they had created an incredibly dangerous situation where assets that, that should have been worth 80% of what they once were are now virtually worth nothing. Well, when the government wants to bail these financial institutions out, they also basically face the same problem. Who's going to buy these assets? Um, and we had various attempts to do something about it. The first one was the, the TARP fund that um, got launched even by Bush and his Treasury Sec Secretary Paulson before they left office. And very quickly after that, the Obama administration came in and Timothy Geithner um, is coming up with various sort of public-private partnerships where you're looking for people you're putting together groups of people who will come in and buy these toxic assets. But the problem is the price is actually, you have to overpay for them and knowingly do so. In the end, what really happened, what saved the financial, what saved these major banks was Ben Bernanke, who was then chairman of the Fed, he just came in and just threw money at them. They never really succeeded in a very good plan for how do we separate out the bad assets from the good ones. How do, <coughs> instead what they did, they just started loaning money at zero interest rates as much as the banks wanted. And first they did it by lowering the discount rate down to zero. Then they had a major problem, which is the law said that only actually, only banks can borrow at the discount river window and they needed major financial players who were technically not banks to be able to do that. So they changed that interpretation and let everybody, all the big players, borrow whatever they wanted at zero rate interest. Um, and then they basically continued that program and that's what quantitative easing basically comes down to. So as soon as everybody knows that all of these major players can borrow an infinite amount at zero interest rate, now you don't have to worry that they're going to go bankrupt. What we ended up with was even fewer large banks that are even bigger and therefore too big to fail. That's what we ended up with. But when you, the details of the story I think are worth knowing because it makes you realize the Wizards of Wall Street no, they can be idiots. They did things they had no idea what the consequences and risks involved were, even for themselves, much less for the rest of us. And the people who are looking after this and supposedly making sure that insurance companies actually hold some of their pre No, there's a loophole there. That wasn't happening. The rating agencies, were they really looking to see if these things deserve to be? No, that wasn't happening. Were the people that were processing the loan applications, did they care whether these were creditworthy customers? No, that wasn't happening. It's truly mind boggling. And it was a huge enough financial crisis that it triggered the Great Recession. And here in Europe, you're still very much in the middle of it. 
and about to dip back again. So I think it's worth knowing the details so one doesn't hold players in awe who have so thoroughly discredited themselves that they should never be allowed to be making decisions that affect the rest of us again. And yet if you look at who is making decisions, who are the advisors, in the United States were the people in charge of the banks replaced. When, when, the, when, when the government came in and saved the banks, did it insist on them changing any policies? No. Did it insist on them changing personnel? No. We extracted no concessions from them for the bailout, for the gift of giving them their life back. We extracted absolutely no concessions, and they are still very much in charge. Um, and in case you're wondering whether the Financial Reform Act that was passed finally in 2009, um, did that really re-regulate the financial industry in the United States? Absolutely not. It was basically a political fig leaf that the politicians handed to the financial industry because there was fury in the United States. Right and left, everybody was up in arms over what these people had done. And essentially what the, the Financial Relief Act that was passed in 2009 did was it pretended that we had somehow gone ahead and re-regulated the financial industry so that nothing like this would ever happen again. There's not a single thing they did that they can't still do. And the problem about too big to fail is even worse than it used to be. Um, I'm not in the business of predicting when or the inevitability or when the next financial crisis is going to take place. But if you simply look at how the system is working now and compare it to, well, how was it working in 2007? How was it working in 2006? The system is every bit as dangerous now as it was back before the last financial crisis. There's been no successful financial reform in the United States and really not any in Europe as a result of all this. Okay. Um, moving on. I'm going to talk about six myths briefly. Six myths about private enterprise and, um, and markets, and three myths about government, and two myths about globalization. Neoliberal economics departs from the assumption that a private enterprise market economy is the best kind of economy we humans could hope for. That's its departing assumption. And proceeds to insist that this kind of economy functions best when unimpeded by government interference. That's the essential message of what neoliberal economics is. Now, earlier names for neoliberal economics were actually a little less obscure and more descriptive. It used to be called laissez-faire economics, literally French for leave it alone. That's the part about don't interfere. The government should not be interfering in the economy. And it's also, was, was before the sort of turn neoliberal came around, it was something just called free market economics. Um, but in any case, the mythologizing begins by giving private enterprise and markets names that are literally dripping in virtue, referring to them as free enterprise and free markets. The second step is creating a series of myths that free enterprise and markets can be relied on to generate fair and efficient outcomes while miraculously providing everyone with economic freedom at the same time. Those are the six myths about private enterprise and markets that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then the third step is to vilify government intervention as counterproductive violations of our freedoms. And the fourth step is to apply neoliberal logic to restructuring the global economy and conclude that all restrictions on the free movement of goods and investment among countries should be abolished. That's what neoliberal economics is. That essentially is what it consists of. Well, the first myth is that free enterprise equals economic freedom. 
No, it doesn't. What happens when people's economic freedoms conflict? What happens when the freedom of an employer to use his machinery as he chooses conflicts with my freedom as the employee to use my labor as I choose to and engage in my What happens when we have somebody who exercises their freedom to pollute? Doesn't that conflict with somebody's freedom to live a life free from being polluted? So the first problem is that when you look at what, when you define economic freedom as the freedom to do whatever you wish with your person and property, there are all sorts of situations where people's economic freedoms are going to come into conflict with one another. Well, what decides whose freedom takes priority over whose freedom is the property rights system. Does the polluter have the property right? Does the pollution victim have the property right? So it's really the property rights. The first problem with this whole approach is, A, it doesn't resolve all the important issues of conflicting economic freedoms, and B, it just punts down the road and says, well, that'll be settled by the property rights system. Well, that's well enough, but somebody better ask, well, does a particular property rights system distribute decision-making authority in a way that is democratic and acceptable? And in the end, what it really comes down to is the property rights system distributes economic freedom so those with less property have less economic freedom and those with more property have more economic freedom. That's what the property rights system does. Now, there's one particular area where neoliberals have sort of had a lot to say, and that's about <clears throat> what about the conflict between the freedom of people to control their own laboring capacities and the freedom of employers to use their capital and machinery and equipment as they see fit. And the answer that they've always given to this is, oh, economic freedom is the freedom to use your person and property as you see fit, including the freedom to contract with others regarding its use. So in the neoliberals' view, when an employee signs a wage agreement, signs a wage contract or goes to work, they have of their own free will and made a voluntary choice, yes, I am going to allow you to decide what's done in the workplace. You're going to get to decide what I produce and how I produce it. But I have freely entered into that contractual arrangement because I find it sufficiently beneficial. Well, the real problem with that is it really true that everyone is equally free to become an employer rather than an employee? And if you look at any even simple models of what would be the rational thing for people to do, the real issue is when people come to this labor market, if some come with more capital than others, that is going to settle who ends up being the employers and who ends up being the employees. Differences in preferences over whether I like being bossed around or I don't being, that's not what's going to settle it. Rational choice in a situation where you come to the bargaining table with unequal assets, that's where the coercion comes in. Sure, the employee freely chooses to go ahead and work for somebody else. Would they have freely chosen to be the one that showed up at the labor market without any capital? That's where the coercion and that's, that's where the coercion part comes in. Yeah, I think this analogy is actually very, very sort of useful to think about. Think about a slave system. A slave system where slaves apply to be slaves for masters of their choice clearly is better than one where owners trade slaves among themselves. Who wouldn't think that the first is a better slave system than the second? A slave system where people are assigned randomly to be slaves or slave masters is better than one where blacks are slaves and whites are masters. 
But abolition of slavery is better than even the least objectionable kind of slavery. The reasoning is exactly analogous. A labor market where employees are free to apply to work for employers of their choice is better than one where employers trade employees among themselves. A system where who become employers and who become employees is truly a random walk, where it isn't a tilted field, where it's highly predictable who's going to end up being in which role. But if we had, if we had a labor market where who became employees is truly a random walk, that would be better than one where wealthy predictably become the employers and the poor predictably become the employees. But abolition of wage slavery, replacing the roles of employer and employee with self-management for all, is better than even the least objectionable system of private enterprise. Free enterprise is efficient. Look, it is true. Sometimes competition for profit drives capitalists to favor more efficient technologies. But sometimes it drives them to favor less efficient technologies. I'm listing three situations in which profit maximization will require the capitalist to choose a less efficient technology over a more efficient technology. When capitalists figure out whether a new technology is going to lower production costs, they don't take externalities into account. They only worry about the new technology's effect on the cost they pay for. If there's cost for society they don't pay for, if there are negative externalities, they do not get taken into consideration when a capitalist looks to see is this new technology going to be more profitable or less profitable. Best point, think about for 200 years, the price on carbon emissions has been zero. Anybody that wanted to spew carbon into the atmosphere was free to do so. You don't think that biased the choice of technologies over transportation and energy systems and what was chosen and what was. It certainly had an effect on what was profitable and what wasn't profitable. But part of why some things were profitable was because one of their serious costs was not being taken into account. And part of why other things were considered not profitable, other technologies were not considered to be profitable, was precisely because in an area where they were very beneficial, there was absolutely zero weight being put on the fact that they had a less damaging effect on the environment. Um, if you've read the Piketty book, you know that R greater than G is the story of the month. Maybe it'll be the story of the year. I hope it's the story of the year. It turns out, and this is kind of a technical point, and I do work in this area. It turns out that if the rate of profit in the economy is higher than the rate of economic growth, that some inefficient, less efficient, capital saving, labor using technologies or changes will be adopted. Even though it's less efficient, you'll have some capital saving, labor using changes which will be adopted because they are profitable even though they are less efficient if the rate of profit is higher than the growth rate in the economy. And you'll have another problem which is some efficient capital using, labor saving changes will not be adopted. Even though they are adopted, even though they are more efficient, they will be rejected because they will be less profitable. So this is a second area in which there's sort of a fundamental bias in the choice of technologies where there's, there's, a, there's a wedge between what is actually more efficient and what is more profitable. There's a wedge that causes two kinds of, you get sins, I call them sins of, sins of commission, when you choose a less efficient technique because it's more profitable, and sins of omission when you reject a more efficient technology because it's less profitable. And these sins of commission and omission will be committed by profit-maximizing capitalists whenever R is higher than G. And if R, the higher R is compared to G, 
the more of these mistakes from society's points of view will be going on regarding the choices of technology by profit-maximizing capitalists. And the last way is inefficient technologies will be favored whenever their effect on bargaining power outweighs their effect on productivity. Suppose you have a new technology and it increases productivity by a little bit. Well, that means it's more efficient. We need to have it adopted. But suppose this new technology has an effect on the bargaining power between employers and employees. Suppose it enhances, in some way, it enhances the power the employees have when they go to bargain with the employer. If this bargaining power effect of the new technology is greater than the productivity effect, then a profit-maximizing capitalist will not adopt a more productive technology if the increase in productivity is smaller than the shifting of the balance of power and negotiations over what? Negotiations over the wage rate and negotiations over how hard the workers are going to have to work to get that wage. Um, Okay, suppose when you take quality into effect, um, automobile industry. You can make automobiles on an assembly line. You can also make automobiles in work teams. Suppose, particularly when you take quality into effect, that is, bad cars that you have to pay for because they were broken, that there is, that the work team technology is actually a more efficient way to make cars. Yeah, but if you have people working in teams, they sort of learn to work. They can talk to each other. They communicate with one another. They conspire with one another against you, their employer. Whereas if everybody's on an assembly line, can't hear anybody else, has nothing to do with anybody else, you essentially have a more malleable workforce when it comes down to negotiating. So there is an example. And there's, there's decent evidence to suggest, because we actually had an experiment we had an experiment in the automobile industry where all of a sudden some companies, Volvo in particular, sort of shifted over to these team production, and what it did was it dramatically reduced defects. And it really wasn't any more time consuming. So it was a productivity enhancement. And yet that's not the way anybody's making cars anyplace. We're right back to the old assembly line. Well, how do you explain that? Um, Well, free enterprise is fair. In a world where the 85 richest people have more wealth than the poorest 3.5 billion, it's really hard to argue that capitalism distributes the burdens and benefits of economic cooperation fairly. But, you know, even under, I mean, the first thing a neoliberal would tell you is, yeah, but the real world has many imperfections, and that doesn't mean my idealized idea of how a completely free capitalist economy would work would necessarily be so unfair. Even under the best of circumstances, in a free enterprise system, the grandson of a Rockefeller who might not have to work a single day in his life is still going to consume a thousand times more than hardworking, productive people simply because he inherited shares of stock from his grandfather. There's just no way around that. OK, myth number four. Markets equal economic freedom. Well, what are the problems with that? Well, the one that's been pointed out more, most often is in market elections, it's one dollar, one vote, not one person, one vote. I mean, who would argue for a? Who would say that a political election was a fair election when some people get to vote a thousand times and other people vote once? And yet that's exactly what sort of that's exactly what um, <coughs> goes on in market in, in market elections. Again, whether or not there's coercion in market exchanges, a market exchange is always voluntary. And unless somebody made a mistake, both people ended up 
better off for having made it. That doesn't necessarily mean the real key, the focus of attention, just like the focus of attention in terms of whether free enterprise is economic freedom is, wait a minute, when there's conflicts, the property rights, it's the property rights system that decides. Here again, <laughs> it's what people arrive at the marketplace with. It's the situations they arrive in that basically determine whether or not there's coercion or not coercion. How about external parties? We've known since the, since the writings of, of Pigou, famous British economist, Cambridge University in the early 1920s. We've known about externalities. Um, sometimes they're called neighborhood effects. Now we tend to call them externalities. Well, wait a minute. In the market decision-making process, the buyer and the seller come to an agreement. They're the ones at the table. They're the ones who have power over the decision. An, external, an externality is there are other people out there who were affected by that decision, and the whole point is they weren't at the bargaining table. That's why they're called external parties. So every time a market exchange, every time there's an external effect from a market exchange, think about it. There are a whole bunch of disenfranchised people out there. All the people who suffered these external effects were disenfranchised from the decision-making process because the decision-making process was done by the buyer and the seller only. Hard to think of that as as markets equal economic freedom. I mean, the last myth is that there really are only two choices. It was a famous British economist named Alec Nove, who in 1983 threw down the gauntlet in a book called The Economics of Feasible Socialism, ironically. He said, look, there are only two choices. At the same time that Margaret Thatcher was saying there's there's no choice or alternative to neoliberal capitalism. Alec Nov was saying there is no choice between either markets or authoritarian planning. There simply is no alternative. He was basically arguing that the idea that we could do something called democratic planning is basically a myth and people should stop deceiving themselves. Well, as, as Jason and some people here with me know, I've spent a good part of my life basically <coughs> outlining exactly how you could engage in participatory planning. It's not authoritarian planning, and it's not a market. So whether you like it or not, it's just not true that there is no alternative. It's sort of the, the, the oldest play in the playbook. Just tell people, there's only two alternatives. Then we don't have to discuss the third alternative. You just assert there is none. Well, I think that's the, the, that's the final thing that's wrong with the myth that <coughs> markets, that markets are, are delivering freedom. Are markets fair? Let's stop worrying about the Rockefellers for a moment. So maybe it's unfair that the grandson of a Rockefeller gets, very, gets to consume a lot bec without doing anything because he inherited shares of stock from his grandfather. What if wage, so <clears throat> let's just take a look at wages and salaries. The labor markets distribute income fairly. Even if wages and salaries were determined in competitive labor markets, free from discrimination, a surgeon who's on the golf course by 2 p.m. would consume 10 times more than a garbage collector working 50 hours per week. I call it the doctor garbage collector problem. That's what free labor markets will get you. The problem is differences in the values of people's contributions for reasons other than differences in efforts or sacrifice they make are beyond people's ability to control. And I think you can make a perfectly sound argument and therefore they carry no moral weight in terms of who deserves to get what. <clears throat>
So I don't think that labor markets, free labor markets, free of discrimination <coughs> are fair either. Markets are efficient. I teach microeconomic theory. I've taught it for 40 years. Here's where something that is almost the sort of hallmark, it's, it's the cornerstone of sort of neoliberal economics at a theoretical level. It's called the fundamental theorem of welfare economics. Students in my class have to learn how to prove it. If they don't prove it, they don't pass my class. What does it say? The fundamental theorem of neoclassical welfare th economics says, if all markets are perfectly competitive, if all markets are in equilibrium, and if there are no externalities, then the outcome would be efficient. OK. And when any of these ifs don't happen to hold, what does the theorem say? It says the outcomes will be inefficient. So if non-competitive market structures and externalities are ubiquitous, if markets are frequently out of equilibrium, what the fundamental theorem of welfare economics teaches us, if we care to actually read it and think about what it says, is that free market capitalism is going to generate outcomes that are very inefficient a lot of the time. That's a far cry from market systems. For whatever else they may do that you may find a little bit of objection, but at least they do things efficiently. No, they don't. No, they certainly don't. Well, myth number seven is that taxation is theft. And I guess maybe, maybe over here that's not the way taxation is treated. But boy, I live in a country where I think it's over 50% of the population that really thinks any time that somebody comes and takes taxes from them that they're getting stolen from. Um, well, there's a public good theorem, and it's part of mainstream economic theory also, if anybody cares to actually read it. And what it says is, except in the highly unlikely case, now that part's added. That's not actually in the theorem. I'm going to argue that this case in which there's a, there's a single situation in which, in which a market system will allocate resources efficiently to public goods. And I think when you see what the theorem says that situation is, you'll realize that is a very, very highly unlikely thing. So except in the highly unlikely case where everyone benefits individually from a public good, at least as much as it costs to produce the public good. So you've got a bunch of people who benefit from a public good. If each one of them benefits at least as much as it costs to make the good they're all enjoying, then and only then will a market system allocate an efficient amount of resources to the, public, to the, to the, to the production of the public good. Nonetheless, neoliberals, so the point is that without taxation to purchase an amount of public goods that whose benefits merit the cost of society, we would have precious little, if any, public goods. And there's nothing, there's nothing efficient about having precious few public goods. Nonetheless, neoliberals continue to treat taxation as if it were a crime rather than an absolute necessity in any even moderately sane economic system. OK, this one afflicts Europe more than any place else on the planet now. A good budget is a balanced budget. No, it's not. The first problem is what's prudent for individuals and what's prudent for the government are not always the same thing. And this is where people's gut instincts get them dead wrong on this issue. And I come from a state, Oregon, where we have a lot of just 
good citizens and people who think they ought to do the right thing. And they say to themselves, look, if something happens and my family, somebody in my family gets laid off or gets their hours cut back and our income goes down, well, the responsible thing for us to do is we've got to cut back on our spending. And it's only irresponsible thing, people who don't do that. And they take that analogy that they apply to themselves as an individual and they apply that reasoning to a good government if it discovers that its revenues are down. A good government that's prudent and responsible will understand it has to cut its spending. And only irresponsible governments or politicians who are behaving in an irresponsible way would fail to do that. This was the greatest piece of wisdom that it, I mean, this was the single piece of wisdom that Keynes brought to the economics profession and the world 80 years ago. And if he hadn't been a lord, I don't think anybody would have believed it. And if he hadn't been recognized as the greatest economist of the 20th century, I don't think anybody would have believed it. And if we hadn't been in the middle of the Great Depression, where doing just the opposite was making the Depression even worse, I don't think anybody would have ever believed it. So in pre-Keynes, pre-Depression times, standard economic wisdom was the intuitive idea that if the government's tax revenues are down, then responsible governments should decrease their spending. And what Keynes pointed out was, no, 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 al contraire, no. Because if your tax revenues are down because your economy is in a recession, and you now as a government cut your own spending, you're going to cut demand further for goods and services. That's going to throw even more people out of work, and people out of work don't pay taxes. Now, let's see if we have some new evidence to once again prove what should never have had to be proved again after the Great Depression and after Keynes. And that is, when there's a recession in the economy, of course tax revenues will be down. But to respond to that by cutting government spending is simply going to make the problem worse. Well, let's see how the problem has gotten worse. You've been pursuing that anti-Keynesian logic under the name of austerity here in Europe now for seven years. In the column marked unemployment, I'm basically showing you what is the damage to society that has come from this austerity. These are unemployment rates. Those are, those are roughly current unemployment rates in Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. That stands for a tremendous amount of social pain and a tremendous amount of social stress on the societal fabric. And there really is no end in sight. Now, what was the purpose of the austerity? The austerity basically said, well, the recession hit and your deficits have gone up. You've got to get your debt to GDP ratio down. You've got to get yourself in order. And to do that, we're going to order up. You've got to cut spending. So the austerity policies have mostly consisted of imposed spending cuts on these governments. The exact logic of your tax revenues are down, so it's irresponsible for you not to be spending less. We're going to force you to do that. And look what happened to the debt-GDP ratios between 2007 and 2014 in those countries. They're the pigs. So you ignore Keynes. You ignore the lessons of the Great Depression. You ignore what used to be in all of the textbooks saying, hey, when you have a recession, the government's job is to increase spending, not decrease spending. That's what's going to pull us out. You increase spending so you get production up. When production's up, it's income's up. And when the income goes up, you're going to collect more taxes. That's the way it works. Rather than you cut spending, 
Demand goes down, production goes down, income goes down, and tax revenues go down even further. So all the pain that's been inflicted on the pigs, look what it's done. Has it even solved the single-minded problem that the person prescribing the medicine is prioritizing as the be-all and the end-all? It's completely counterproductive and self-defeating. Look what happened to those debt-to-equity ratios in every country that applied the austerity medicine. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Regulation is unnecessary. Well, in 1999, Lawrence Summers convinced Bill Clinton to agree to revoke the linchpin of bank regulation in the US, the Glass-Steagall Act, on grounds that banks knew better how to manage risk and could be trusted to self-regulate. Well, that certainly worked out well. Free market environmentalism insists that the Coase theorem proves that polluters and pollution victims will negotiate efficient levels of emissions between themselves once property rights are clarified, obviating any necessity for government regulation of pollution. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I've published seven articles on the subject. It's complete and total nonsense. And an assumption of perfect information conveniently renders all regulations regarding product safety as unnecessary. But most of us do not have the time or money necessary to discover when we are being lied to. Besides, it would be inefficient for every person to have to go out and investigate whether or not every product that they buy is actually safe or not. Why wouldn't we collectively pay for that rather than individually each have to pay for it every single time. Government is inherently inefficient. OK, I'm going to give you this. Yes, big government is often inefficient. So is big business. Matter of fact, so is small business. So part of the myth here is to sort of say, oh, let's look at all these examples of government inefficiency. And we never have a subject called, let's look at a whole bunch of examples of private business inefficiency. Bus big, big organizations can be inefficient, whether government or not. Now, let's take a look at one area of efficiency. Let's take a look at health care. In Canada, where health care insurance is provided by the government, per capita spending on health care. Now, I'm making an assumption here. And I know that, believe me, this can be debated till the cows come home. I'm going to make a rough assumption. I know that part of your health care delivery is a little better here compared to the US, and part is a little better in the US. And in Canada, they do some things a little bit. I'm just going to say that, roughly speaking, what we're getting is pretty much the same or equivalent in all three countries. There's just not, there are huge differences between the health care you get in some third world countries and the health care you get in advanced economies. I don't think there are huge differences in the quality of the health care that people are getting in the UK and in Canada and the United States. So let's say we're roughly getting the same quality health care. How much do we pay for it? Well, in Canada, Per capita spending is only four. So think of it this way. To get the health care that the Canadians get, on average, it costs a Canadian $4,445. To get the same health care in the United States, it's almost double. There's only one difference between our health care system and Canada's. We have, a private we have private business called private medical insurance companies. And in Canada, they have a single payer system that's a government insurance program. Government insurance program, private insurance program. In the UK, healthcare services are provided by the government as well as the insurance, and per capita spending on healthcare is only $3,400. So you tell me, who's more efficient at providing healthcare insurance? Who's more efficient at providing healthcare services, government or the private sector? It's simply not true that in all situations, the government is, by assumption or by definition, 
has to be less efficient than private producers. Free trade is better. Look, if opportunity costs of producing goods are different in different countries, there are potential efficiency gains from specialization in trade. It's pointless to deny that. That's David Ricardo 101, and he was right. However, if commercial prices do not accurately reflect the true social opportunity costs of traded goods, free trade can easily produce a counterproductive pattern of specialization yielding global efficiency losses. So just saying that, oh, if there are differences in opportunity costs of producing things in different countries means that we could have efficiency, an efficiency gain through specialization in trade doesn't mean that if you simply open up to free trade, you get the efficient pattern of specialization. Because it's the commercial prices inside countries that signal what will be exported and what will be imported. And if there are significant externalities affecting, if, if, if the externalities are creating wedges between true social costs and commercial costs, you can easily get counterproductive divisions of labor internationally. If prices for less developed country exports are highly volatile, this can damage their economies, leading to global efficiency losses. There's been a long debate about whether or not there's been a, a deterioration in the terms of trade for you know, less developed countries, the commodities they tend to export. Put that aside. Don't even worry about that. If small countries are very reliant on exporting a particular good to an international market and, that interna and those international market prices for their commodities are highly volatile, it basically can make it totally impossible for an economy to have the kind of stability that allows for any kind of development. When productivity gains from a new international division of labor are small and adjustment costs are large, we get efficiency losses. Look, the people who decide whether or not to increase specialization in trade, the businesses that decide that, well, we're now going to export this. We're going to move resources out of this industry and we're going to export instead of producing domestically. Those, business, those decision makers aren't the ones that have to, adjust, that have to suffer the adjustment costs. If increasing, in, in the United States, increasing specialization in trade basically meant moving a whole bunch of industries from the Northeast into an underpopulated section in the Southwest. Well, the adjustment costs, including abandoning all sorts of infrastructure in the Northeast and building it all over again. The decision makers who decided they weren't taking those costs into account, those are the adjustment costs, they didn't take them into account because they don't pay for them. If the adjustment costs are big and the difference in in, in opportunity costs are relatively small, you can get efficiency losses, not gains from trade. If less, to, and, and the big one is, this, this last one is the big one. Um, there's a person here at Cambridge University who I think is the, you know, the most notable exponent who has explained this the best, is Ha Jun Chang. And he's written numerous books that are available, you know, that are, that are accessible to the public as well as professionally on this subject. And what he points out is, if less developed economies further specialize in the sectors they've always specialized in, it is less likely they will find ways to increase their productivity. I mean, why are they less productive in the first place? Because those things they specialize in, it's not a very productive thing to be specializing in. More capital mobility is better. It is inefficient to prevent capital from moving to wherever it is most productive. But this does not necessarily mean that capital liberalization, allowing capital to move wherever it wants to, will necessarily increase global productivity. Because profitability is not the same as productivity. There are a ton of reasons that it might be more profitable to move my plant and produce in a third world country. The wages could be lower. 
the, the, <coughs> the environmental regulations could be more lax. The business taxes could be lower. If that's why it's more profitable, I move. I didn't mention that my capital is actually more productive down there. So there are plenty of reasons that firms move that have nothing to do with the fact that the machine is actually going to make somebody more productive when it's abroad than it would have been if it had been used at home. It's also not true that all loans increase productivity. In the 70s, the dictator of Zaire borrowed billions in the, international, uh, in the international credit markets. And he mostly used that to sort of, <coughs> it was graft. He and his family just took it. Um, he armed people to basically suppress his own people. So here are all these loans. These loans went to Zaire. They didn't go to, they didn't go to venture capitalists out in San Francisco who were working on the internet, who might have gotten it even faster because it went to Zaire. Did it increase productivity in Zaire one iota? No, and that's why when it came time to pay the loans back, there was nothing to pay them back with, of course. So just because somebody has borrowed money and is willing to pay a higher interest rate than somebody else doesn't mean they're going to make more productive use of that. There are many cases in which it isn't. And then the final thing is that if capital liberalization makes the global financial system less safe, and more risk prone. And if it leads to things like the East Asian economic crisis of 97, 98, 99. I mean, it was really ironic. Paul Krugman at the time reminded readers in the United States and readers in the advanced economies, he said, you know, this East Asian financial crisis um, was the biggest falling from economic grace that the world economy has seen since the Great Depression. It just didn't happen to happen in Europe or the United States. Well, at the time, I don't think he ever imagined that something similar or even worse would happen here in 2008, but it did. So financial, if, and I think the argument can easily be made, if capital liberalization is part of the process of creating an even more risk-prone global financial system, then the consequences are all the productivity losses when you have something like the East Asian crisis, all the productivity losses of all those unemployed people and the pigs who haven't been working for five years now. So those are the myths that I think, when subjected to any sort of careful thought, turn out to be just that. They turn out to be things that people say, things that serious people say to each other, things that serious people believe, things that serious people repeat, and it doesn't mean they're right, and it doesn't mean they make sense. In short, neoliberalism is very bad economic policy indeed, and unless you're in the 1%, The rest of us are going to continue to suffer needlessly until we rid ourselves of this rotten albatross around our necks. It really is a mindset that we people have to rid ourselves of, and then we have to simply force anybody that's in a decision-making position um, not to just continue to sort of do these things no matter how counterproductive as well as damaging as they turn out to be. Okay, thank you. We have about 10 minutes for any questions from the audience. Um, Oops, go ahead. Yes. Um, I think there are, <coughs> there are many kinds of capitalism, and they're not all created equal. Some are much worse. Um, and I think neoliberal capitalism, the kind of capitalism that we have today, um, 
unregulated, incredibly damaging to the environment, escalating inequality, um, loss of public services that are absolutely essential. I think that this is a particularly virulent and damaging kind of capitalism. I think it is different from the kind of capitalism that reached its heyday in the Scandinavian model of the 1970s. I call that social democratic capitalism. Here in Europe, you understand that. I know you have a labor party, so you don't call it social democratic. But in Europe, people understand the term social democratic capitalism. In the United States, they don't because we don't have a social democratic party. So <clears throat> whether you a regulated capitalism, a capitalism with unions that are strong, a capitalism with minimum wages, a capitalism with sufficient taxes so that you adequately fund a public education system. That's a, that kind of capitalism, I think, is, is it qualitatively different from neoliberal capitalism? Here's what they, what they have in common is they are both fundamentally, the, the fundamental institutions in both of those kinds of capitalism are private enterprise and markets. But, I mean, one of the things that happens in social democratic capitalism is at least you don't trust private enterprise to handle health insurance because that's insane. Um, so, yes, I think it's important to distinguish between neoliberal capitalism and what I call social democratic capitalism. And I think it's important because a lot of what people want, a lot of what we have lost and a lot of the fight that we have to engage in is to essentially go back and win back some of the sensible kind of reforms that we once had that were basically eliminated you know, over the past 30 years now. So that's why I do think, I do draw a distinction between neoliberal capitalism um, and, uh, and what I call social democratic capitalism. And I think that the difference is huge and the difference is worth fighting for. Now, I say this my entire life, I've been more than willing to give up on capitalism altogether, including social democratic capitalism. I do think that the human species is more than capable of organizing our economic affairs in a very different way. For me, social democratic capitalism is still essentially the economics of competition and greed. You're still motivating people through competition and greed, and you're ameliorating the consequences, and you're basically mitigating the damages. And one of the things that we now have learned, when, when, <clears throat> when I was growing up, I assumed my problem with social democratic capitalism was it was just too slow. The progress was too slow. Why couldn't we make more progress faster? Well, well, it's not just slow, though. It's been proved to be it's unsustainable. I mean, it, it, it's simply not, you can't, in my view, is that capitalism cannot be reformed. And I, you know, I, I don't think we can, capitalism, even social democratic capitalism, cannot solve, it cannot solve the, um, the eco ecological crisis that we face. It just can't, even with, 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 with reform, because... Because it requires, it requires cooperation and not competition. I agree, so I think by yes. Calling, by not calling capitalism out, you're giving people... Oh, but I do call capitalism out. But you're, you're calling it neoliberalism rather than capitalism. No, I call capitalism out, and my, my, the major work I do and what I am most responsible for is saying, you, people are telling you there's no alternative between capitalism and communism. They just want you to think that. A system of participatory economics and participatory planning, a system that is truly designed to be one that is a system of equitable cooperation rather than trying to harness competition and greed and ameliorate the damage that's done is a different kind of system. It's perfectly possible. It's been possible for 150 years. It doesn't require a lot of fancy technology. It just requires doing it. So I am completely, I've been, I've been willing to, I mean, if I could get 51% of the population to agree with me, I've been ready to get rid of all forms of capitalism for 50 years now. However, I think it's simply not the case. And it's not the case that all forms of capitalism have been equally horrific. 
But I do agree with you that one of the things that, in my youth, I thought, so what's wrong with social democratic capitalism is it never can really give us true economic justice, complete economic justice. It can never really give us complete, complete economic democracy. It can't truly protect and sort of and the, the environment. So it can't really give us all that we have every right and ability to grasp. That's what's wrong with it. And it's just too slow. Getting these reforms is too slow, but I assumed we were always going to continue to be slowly getting a little better. And what the last 30 years has proved is that social, that's, that's a very unwarranted assumption. That if you do not, as long as you leave corporations and private enterprise and markets in place, they can basically roll back your reforms faster than, a, than the twinkle of an eye. And that's what's happened. We have watched. We have watched all the gains of literally 50 years of slow progress and reformism be wiped out before our eyes. And even when the policies responsible for creating the latest crisis, they are being used to just further the campaign of eliminating all those reforms and all those gains. And I was in Finland two years ago, and they said, yeah, well, you're... I asked them, don't you, don't you regret losing your welfare state? Oh, yeah. We really liked all that stuff. Well, then why aren't you upset? Oh, but don't you understand? We can't afford it anymore. What utter nonsense. The Finnish economy is twice as productive as it was 30 years ago. That means it can, this, they can afford twice as much of everything. But it... I do agree with you. One of the things that in my younger life I completely underestimated <coughs> was just how unstable social democratic reformed capitalism is. That you cannot just count on the fact, okay, maybe I'm impatient, but you know, slowly things are always going to get better. No. We have 30 years and a great recession and a financial crisis to prove that things can go very, very quickly in the wrong direction into a neoliberal version of capitalism that's far worse than the one that some countries once had. 